And greetings and love to everyone. My name is Brother Jayananda. We're here at Mother Center, and we have a service this morning on the subject of the secret of spiritual progress. So let's begin our service this morning with a prayer. Please put your attention within, focus at the point between the eyebrows. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda. Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Divine Mother, beloved Guru, bless our lives with an ever-increasing realization of thine indwelling presence, that we find thee in all the activities of life, in the tests and trials, in the triumphs and victories, that we perceive Thee ever with us, guiding us, inspiring us, with us always, blessing us. Om. Peace. Amen. And we start all of our services in Self-Realization Fellowship with a period of meditation. So we'll start this one with a, a short period of meditation. And as we meditate, try to go deeply within. Guruji says that it's very important um, to have the correct posture. Posture is important. It's keeping the spine erect. The neck, the head, the neck, the, the spine, all in a straight line. You find that position in which you feel no tension, that you're balanced, that your hands are resting on, the, on your thighs, between the thigh and the abdomen, feet flat on the floor, or cross-legged if that's your preference. And the second part about um, posture is to keep the eyes at the point between the eyebrows, the spiritual eye, the kutasta. The more we focus there, the more deeply we can feel that peace and attunement that comes with the deeper silence we experience in meditation. So we'll start with a chant and then meditate, and then we'll get into the subject of the secret of spiritual progress. A reminder, let's uh, sit upright. I want to focus the eyes at the point between the eyebrows. Start with the chant, listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget thee, I will never forsake thee. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never forget thee. I will never forsake thee. I will never forget thee. I will never forsake thee. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. Listen, listen, listen to
Hello. It's nice to be with you. Normally we speak to, you know, in temples or in, we have a crowd of people. Uh, there's a little strange talking to a camera, but I'm imagining all of you around the world who are tuning in to find some inspiration or some um, understanding of Master's teaching. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. And as I said, this morning or in this service, we're talking about the secret of spiritual progress. And um, it's a secret, so I can't really say anything. But that's not the case. <laughs> we all want secrets. We all want, um, often through the years, I hear people say, brother, what's, what's, the, what's the one thing I need to do? What's the, what's the, is there a, a hidden shortcut to attain what I want to attain? I remember a story early on, many years ago in the ashram. Brother Anandamoy lived here at Mother Center. And one day, he, one afternoon, he was down in the monk's kitchen, and there was a group of monks that were surrounding him. I was one of them. And he had just read some article about the, or something on the children of Fatima, the Fatima, Portugal, where they had the vision of Divine Mother, these three children. And he was telling us it was very inspiring to read about their lives. And what he said was, he said the little boy was a part of that group. He was like six years old or nine years old when this happened. He said that ever afterwards, when that happened, he would you know, travel with his friends towards school. But as, as they got close to school, he would peel off and go into a church where he would sit all day long. And uh, Brother Anandamoy said he would go into ecstasy. And then the children coming home from school would pick him up at the church and they'd walk home. And that's how he spent his days. And uh, us hearing this, it was very inspiring. I said to Brother Anandamoy, half jokingly, I said, boy, I wish that would happen to me. And Brother looked at me and he says, what do you mean? And I said, uh, I said, well, Brother, I'm just looking for a shortcut. And he looked at me and he says, what do you mean? You have a shortcut, Kriya Yoga. And of course he was right. <laughs> of course he was right. We have shortcuts. We have secrets that have been shared with us. And I think when we're on the path for a while, we tend to forget what those secrets are. You know, one secret is, what is the purpose of life? Now, if you've been on the path for a while, you take this for granted. We learn this in Master's teachings, we read about it, he talks about it, and we come to take it as a, just a given, that the purpose of life is to find God. But look around in the world. How many people know that? How many people even ask the question, what is the purpose of life? Very, very few. And those that ask that question, many, many, or I'd say most, are completely wrong in what they come to as a conclusion. The purpose of life. So that's one, one secret that we all share, huh? the purpose of life. The second is that um, it's not only the purpose of life, but there are things that we can do to make that purpose a realization in our life. There are things that we can do to find that bliss of God, to find God in our lives. That's huge, <laughs> that's huge. And we'll talk about that also. And the third is that the Kriya Yoga meditation that Guruji gave to us is the highest and most effective way to realize that finding God is the purpose of life. To realize that, that bliss within, that we not only know it intellectually, what the purpose of life is, but we know it intuitively in our souls. So we'll talk about those three things this morning. I first wanted to talk about the, uh, or read the Bible and Gita readings for this morning. You know, sometimes we have people asking, why do we read these scriptures? Well, they're very important. Our guru said um, one of the aims and ideals, one of the aims and ideals of Self-Realization Fellowship is to reveal the complete harmony and basic oneness of original Christianity as taught by Jesus Christ and original yoga as taught by Bhagavan Krishna and to show that these principles of truth are the common scientific foundation of all true religions. 
This is one of the pillars, one of the foundations of Self-Realization Fellowship. One of the reasons our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda came to the West and started this, this great movement to show that the East and West, as represented in yoga by Bhagavan Krishna and Christianity as represented by Jesus Christ, these are the foundation of, of this higher age we're moving into. So in these services, we always read from these two scriptures, passages, and then also the commentary that our, our guru gave on them. The Bible passage this morning is um, certainly one we're all familiar with. It's from Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now our guru says, he said, great scientists and literary savants also take care of the necessities of life, but their minds remain mostly engrossed in the subjects in which they have specialized. Similarly, as Jesus himself demonstrated, the divine man maintains his body as the temporary home of the immortal soul and fulfills all of his God-given responsibilities, but his consciousness is firmly centered in God. The ordinary man thinks only of food, possessions, and pleasure. That is all he pursues. Under the smoke screen of materiality, he has totally hidden God from his perception, cutting himself off from life's invigorating source, depleting his happiness and draining dry the truly satisfying divine joys that inhere in his soul. The Western nations at the height of industrial civilization gorged with materiality have not succeeded in producing a society free of depression and discontent. Houses, money, automobiles may be necessary to modern existence, but if man does not also give some time to God and meditation, the formula of his life will be missing the catalyst necessary to produce true happiness. Unless one seeks the kingdom of God, and establishes within himself its righteousness, peace, joy, and wisdom, the contrasts of pleasure and sorrow in his life will foment inner discontentment, unbalance, and physical and spiritual deficiencies. Master goes on to say, India's civilization, in contrast to the West, became wholly absorbed in religion and God-seeking to the neglect of its material life. And so, in spite of its spirituality, it suffered from poverty, famine, sickness, and centuries of foreign domination. The old doctrine of complete renunciation is extreme. If the masses let go of their duties, then communities, cities, and the whole societies would be dens of disease and poverty. Ideal renunciation does not require the total non-possession of a wandering sadhu or a retreat into a mountain cave. It means giving up small, delusive pleasures for the highest joys of the spirit. By renouncing the world and its temptations and living in remote seclusion, one still might not find God, because incarnations of desires trailing down the ages will still be with the recluse. Few there are who can remain continuously in communion with God. When one is not meditating, it is better to keep the mind busy with wholesome work than to be idle. Now there, our guru, he outlines balance of the outer world and balance of the yogi's life with activity and meditation, a big part of what his teachings are all about, is balancing the, the activity, the, the inward, just finding the balance outwardly and inwardly. Now here, here's the, the reading from the Bhagavad Gita and this is in the second chapter. The sloka is, O Arjuna, the ideas of heat and cold, pleasure and pain, are produced by the contacts of the senses with their objects. Such ideas are limited by a beginning and an end. They are transitory, O descendant of, of Bharata. Bear them with patience. And this is an interesting contrast to what we read in the, in the Bible, because in the Bible we were talking about how we balance our lives. This is how do we balance our minds. And one aspect of it is the, the likes and dislikes, the pleasures and pains, the, the heat and cold, learning to live in an even-minded state. Our guru says, 
Through ignorance, the mind of ordinary man chooses to be sensitive and to imagine itself hurt through the senses. The devotee, therefore, should lay great stress upon a mental rising above cold and heat, pain, and temporary pleasures. When a cold or a hot sensation invades the body, when a pleasure visits or pain attacks, it tries to overwhelm man's mind with the idea that the sensation has an inherent power of permanence. Aware of this trick, man should try to adopt a transcendental, indifferent attitude in his response to the inroads of all sensations. When a man adopts a non-excitable state toward sorrows, a non-attached state toward temporary happiness, a stoicism toward irritants that rouse fear and anger and pain. His mind attains an unruffled state of poise. This inward calmness, this evenness, that no matter what happens, you... And our guru, many times, he used to prove to himself that he had this. And we've all read these examples or these stories of him where he was faced with the same things that all of us face in a daily in a daily battle in life. And he wanted to prove to himself that he could overcome come them. Here is one story. This was back when Master first came to this country, 1920s, early 1920s. He was in Massachusetts. And our guru said, one night long ago in Duxbury, Massachusetts, I went to bathe in the ocean in the moonlight. Dr. Lewis and his son Bradford accompanied me. The water felt very cold, but I reminded myself that everything is made of electricity that the same electricity that makes cold also makes heat. And the water itself is nothing more than a manifestation of electrical energies. Just as I was thinking these thoughts, Bradford looked at me strangely, then turned to his father and exclaimed, Swamiji has a light around his body. The light of God had come over me as I refused to accept the sensation of cold and reaffirmed instead the truth that everything is made of divine electricity. Such was the power of our guru and his mind and his ability to see the, the non-permanence of things in this world. Very inspiring. Now, many of us still striving for that state, but nonetheless, our guru gives us these examples and shows what can be attained if we, we keep at this practice. And even in little ways, if we can learn to uh, not be ruffled by the changes in life, the things that come to us, we get gradually gain strength and willpower and uh, really come to the realization that these things are not bothersome to us. So the secrets of spiritual progress, I've, you, as you notice, I've pluralized secrets because there is no one secret. There are many things that help us on the spiritual path. But when we start remembering what these different principles are, they can inspire us in different ways. The first one we had outlined was the, that even knowing the purpose of life, what a great secret our guru has shared with us, because most people in, in life don't know this. Master had many ways of um, demonstrating or uh, painting what life is like. He would say that life is like a hospital or life is like a school in which we graduate, we go to different, different grades. Uh, sometimes he said life is like the, the movie theater where you're watching what's happening on a screen and you, you have an operator behind you and he's projecting and the operator is God and the light from the projector is, is him manifesting life on the screen. And then the audience is so involved in the drama that they cry when, they, when the hero is hurt and applaud when the villain is conquered. But one of the ways that he described life often was that life was like a stage that each one of us, um, we show up on this stage, basically the curtain opens, we find ourselves in a certain costume, dealing with certain characters, and there we do our little part. And he wrote a wonderful little poem. It's in something in Songs of the Soul. It's one of the verses from the poem called Mystery. And Master wrote, this wondrous day Stage set for play by unseen hand. The players drop from no man's land, then vanish all away. With changing scenes of birth and death, the drama's on, 
The actors play anon, yet know not why they play this glorious day. People don't understand why we're in this, this thing called life. And not understanding why we're here, how could we possibly get to the place where we realize what's important in life or put our energies into the things that will bring us the greatest happiness? Purpose of life. It's a huge, um, a huge thing to know and uh, certainly a mystery or a secret that our Guru revealed to us. That we can uh, not only know what the purpose is, but what that purpose means and what it means in our lives. Master had said, unless you understand the meaning and purpose of life, you have not lived well. So it's more than just an introductory stop, a step. It's, an, it's a, something that we have to understand. Unless you understand the meaning and purpose of life, you have not lived well. You look at the great um, people who have wrestled with this in the past and the different ways they went about trying to find out what the purpose of life was. You know, in school we all learn about Henry David Thoreau who went to the woods. I went to the woods to live deliberately and to front the essential facts of life. And basically, I'm thinking from the top of my head here, but he basically said he didn't want to get to the end of life and find that he had not lived. He wanted to see what is essential in life. What is the purpose? You know, here we come to that understanding and that realization through our Guru's generosity in sharing it with us. The purpose of life is not what the world says. In fact, here's a quote from him. He said, the grandest purpose of life, contrary to the implications of novelists, is not to know human love or to produce children or to win men's fickle acclaim. Man's sole worthwhile aim is to find the everlasting bliss of God. Grandest purpose of life, contrary to novelists, and nowadays you'd probably say contrary to screenwriters who produce the movies, it's not to know human love or to produce children or to win men's fickle acclaim, to, to be praised by people. This is not the purpose of life. Man's sole worthwhile aim is to find the everlasting bliss of God. What a tremendous secret we've been let in on. The purpose of life is to find God. Now the second point in this, it's not just enough to know what the purpose is. We have to take a step from, from that understanding and move toward some sort of, toward the realization that this is not only becomes just something that we know in our minds, but something we know in our hearts, know in our souls, know through our intuition. We have, to become, we have to make these truths realizable in our lives. And the second great secret that Guru shares with us, he says there are things we can do or methods to bring about spiritual progress. There are ways to do this. You know, if we've been on the path, we can maybe take, take that for granted. Let me read you something from Autobiography of a Yogi. We've all read it. Near the end of the book, Master talks about Brother Lawrence. And I'll read the section and then tell you what I think he's telling us through it. Our Master had written, Brother Lawrence, the 17th century Christian mystic, tells us his first glimpse of God realization came about by viewing a tree. Nearly all human beings have seen a tree. Few, alas, have thereby seen the tree's creator. Most men are utterly incapable of summoning those irresistible powers of devotion that are effortlessly possessed only by a few single-hearted saints found in all religious paths, whether of East or West. Yet the ordinary man is not therefore shut out from the possibility of divine communion. He needs for soul recollection no more than the Kriya Yoga technique, a daily observance of the moral precepts, an ability to, and an ability to cry sincerely, Lord, I yearn to know Thee. The universal appeal of yoga is thus its approach to God through a daily, usable, scientific method, rather than through a devotional fervor that, for the average man, is beyond his emotional scope. Now, Master, in that little, little two paragraphs there, he summarizes really the 
efficacy of yoga, the necessity of yoga, that this isn't just something that happens to some people who are great saints, and the rest of us just struggling masses, we have no chance to replicate what they've experienced. Now you need a method, you need a method for that, a way of doing it. And Master points out here, he says, you need, you need for soul recollection no more than the Kriya Yoga technique, a daily observance of the moral precepts, and an ability to cry sincerely, Lord, I yearn to know thee. This is what our Guru gives us through our, these teachings. Why? Because most people are utterly incapable, as he says, utterly incapable of summoning those irresistible powers of devotion, effortlessly possessed by saints. We don't have the ability, but there is a method, and this is where India and her profound teachings, and our Guru and Sri Yukteswar and Larry Mahashai and Babaji's uh, unbelievable wisdom to condense it down into a, a teaching and a something that we all can understand, something we all can practice. This is where they, uh, it, 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 it's why they're incomparable. I think why this teaching is incomparable in today's world. There's nothing else that goes to that, the core of truth as these teachings and this, this way of this way of becoming a saint, like a brother Lawrence. You know, with a science, science has to be, there's certain principles it has to have. It has to work. It has to work. The art of uh, finding God is, the, is brother Lawrence seeing a tree and being so ecstatically overjoyed that he goes into samadhi and he, he attains that state. Well. The art is fine, but most people don't have that, as our master says. But a science is a progressive thing that gives you known results. <laughs> I remember heard a story of two old men. One of them says to the other, he says, uh, gee, you know, I got this new hearing aid. He says, it's incredible. I can hear things just tr tremendously clearly. I, this is better than anything I've had in years and years. He said, it's a brand new thing. It's, it's, and the other fellow looks at him, he says, yeah, what kind is it? And he says, oh, it's about quarter after 10, why? It's gotta work, it's gotta work. So if you claim something as a science, there are steps that you take in which you get known results. What are those steps? It's based on the eightfold path of, eightfold path of Patanjali. The eight steps of yoga where you progressively go through these steps and you attain certain realizations along the way. Our guru and his line of gurus have given to the world these eightfold steps for the new age through these teachings. Now, along with this, <laughs> we're talking a lot about meditation and the deeper aspects of yoga, and um, our guru was so balanced, he was so balanced. Um, yes, it is that, those steps, it is that state. But it's also just the, the yamas and niyamas, the do's and the don'ts, the right behavior that's so important to spiritual progress. You know, sometimes you can tend to forget those things. I, you know, they, there's a saying that there are some people who want to clean up the world, but they refuse to help with the dishes. Yeah, it's, it's like you, wherever you're placed, you have to learn to manifest this right behavior, what that looks like. Read you something from our guru. I came across this. It's a, it's a story that we've read in one of his lectures, but it's, it's, it's wonderfully revealing. Master and Sri Keshwar were talking about friendship, evidently, and our guru said to him, that he thought friendship consisted of sincerity. It's, that sincerity was, was the complete package for friendship. But this is the story as our guru relates it. Master says, be true, be sincere, and friendship will steadily grow. I remember a discussion with Sri Teshwar about sincerity. I had said, sincerity is everything. No, he responded, sincerity plus thoughtfulness is everything. 
He went on, suppose you are sitting in the parlor in your home and there's a beautiful new carpet on the floor. It is raining outside. A friend you haven't seen in many years flings open the door and rushes into the room to greet you. That is all right, I said, but Master had yet to make his point. You were sincerely happy to see each other, he said, but wouldn't you have liked it better if he had been thoughtful enough to take off his muddy boots before he came in and ruined the carpet? I had to agree that he was right. Then Master summarized this, he says, no matter how well you think of someone or how close you are to that person, it is important to sweeten that relationship with good manners and thoughtfulness. Then friendship becomes truly wonderful and enduring. Familiarity that leads you to be inconsiderate is very harmful to friendship. This is the other part of, of the spiritual path, living as a yogi, just this learning to behave. How do my actions influence the people around me? What can I do to improve, to uh, be a thoughtful, kind, generous person? And these kinds of questions are very good to be asking now, when many of us are, are um, in a place where we're, maybe we're confined, we're with people that were longer than we normally are. Is there anything I can do to be more thoughtful? This thoughtfulness then spills out into our spiritual life. It's necessary. It's the yamaniya. It's the foundation of, of living the life of a yogi, learning to behave. It covers so much. I remember early on, Brother Pemamoy was the older monk who looked after the postulants when they came in. When I came in the ashram, he was a, the house brother in Encinitas, and he was so highly respected by everyone. And he would tell us little stories that um, would spark us to think, well, how can I be thoughtful? He, he used to say that, uh, he used to say that when he, early on in his years, when he came into the ashram, he was living in a place where um, they had a front door that whenever anyone went out, and went out and closed, it would kind of shake the building. He said there was one monk that whenever he went in or went out, he would make it a point to put his key in the, in the door and just gently close it, and so there's almost no noise. And Brother said he was so thoughtful, he was so appreciative of that. And by telling us that, <laughs> he was saying, this is, how you, this is how you endear yourself, certainly to, to those around you, but also to right behavior and how to behave in different situations that just thinking of others and just going one step further, what can I do to help? This is a, a really something that all of us can work on as we work on our meditation, certainly. Dayamata said, never seek excuses for your weaknesses. That basic principle is bound up in the first two steps of Patanjali's Eightfold Path of Yoga, Yama and Niyama. You can sum them up in just one phrase, be true to yourself. That means be true to every moment, not the ego, not the pseudo soul, but the Atman, your true self or soul. This means to strive earnestly to be honest, sincere, kind, and loving, and to avoid hatred, dishonesty, and anything else that disturbs the soul, that creates nervousness and unrest within, and does not give peace. Well, the third point, we are going to talk about yoga meditation. Kriya Yoga is the most powerful and effective way to bring about spiritual progress. These are the three secrets about spiritual progress that we're talking about today. The third one being that, that it's the most effective way what our Guru has given. When I say Kriya Yoga, certainly I mean the technique. Certainly the technique. It's the most powerful technique given. But Kriya Yoga also can be used in a general sense, meaning the path of Kriya Yoga, which we have all embraced or we're all looking for, for instruction and inspiration in our lives. Why is it that way? Why is it important? Our Guru has this wonderful definition. I often give it <laughs> as a definition in the God Talks with Arjuna. He said, yoga meditation is the process of cultivating and stabilizing an awareness of our real nature through definite spiritual and psychophysical methods and laws 
by which the narrow ego, the flawed hereditary human consciousness, is displaced by the consciousness of the soul. That's a beautiful definition because it covers the, the gamut of what, what meditation does for us, what this path does for us. What happens when we are on a spiritual path and we're making an effort to practice the different aspects that our guru gives to us. We gradually displace this, this false sense of who we are with the nature of the soul. What a tremendous secret we've been given. Who in the world knows what we know? Or has been given what we've been given? It's a complete science. It covers every aspect of life. It's meditation, it's activity, it's the mental ability to remain even-minded no matter what we do. It's the ability to know how to behave in different situations that we find ourselves in throughout the day. We have to keep at it. We have to keep at it. This is, uh, if there is a one secret, I remember I used to be amazed that I had found that in Man's Eternal Quest, there was one statement by Guruji which was italicized. And that was, perseverance is the whole magic of spiritual success. That if you stay at something long enough, if you're making the effort to learn, if you're doing what you can, and yes, going up and down. There are times when, when our meditations are not going as well as we wish. Dayamata used to have things like that. I remember once in a satsang, she was saying, for three weeks I haven't felt, felt Divine Mother's response in meditation. But, she said, but this morning when I was meditating, she would keep at it. And this is normal, this up and down. Keep at it. Perseverance is the whole magic of spiritual success. There was a saint in India. Came across a quote of his many years ago. He had said, the finest timber comes from the slowest growing trees. He who expects to blossom into a yogi in a few months or even a few years of practice is bound to be disappointed. He, however, who has the sincerity and courage to face whatever is in him and the persistence to go on with his struggle in the face of obstacles within and without, and the humility to recognize that all he has done is to take the first few steps on a tremendous journey, he is certain to achieve something which he would not give away in exchange even for the whole world. That's the resolve we need, that's the encouragement that we need, that we just keep at it, we keep at practice, we do the best we can. We read from our Guru's teachings, we study our Guru's teachings to imbibe our consciousness with his thoughts and his way of looking at things and his clarity that he gives to us. Sometimes the seeming lack of spiritual progress on the spiritual path, it can be a great test. We can think, I'm practicing, nothing's happening. Well, that's when you need to redouble your efforts or keep at it. I remember once I went to Dayamata and she said, how are you doing? And I said, well, Ma, I don't feel like I'm making any progress or I don't feel any devotion in meditation. And rather than give me instructions or even um, encouragement or admonishment, and, she said to me, it was almost like she was excited. She said, but that's the time when you can prove to Divine Mother that you really love her. Meaning, this is a great opportunity for you. You don't feel anything? Well, tell Divine Mother. Keep, keep at it. To her, these things were not obstacles. They were, they were opportunities. And we have to get to a place in our sadhana where we realize that. And we keep making an effort and trying to kneel into the opportunities that come our way. from Dayamata. She said, no one ever said that the Lord was going to make life easy for any of us. It is a constant struggle and always will be. All of creation is flowing out of God and most of mankind is flowing with it. The individual who has turned his life towards God is in a sense moving against a tremendous tide. He is trying to go back to the source, whereas everyone else is coursing against him in the opposite direction. 
So it is difficult to find time specifically for God unless you resolutely set it aside as part of your daily schedule. This does not mean that he will then take away all of your problems, but it does mean that from this God contact, you will gain calmness, courage, and strength with which to face whatever comes each day. Sometimes your burdens will be lighter, sometimes not so light, but those are the challenges that have to be met in life. The happiest people are those who have a philosophy to live by. People go to pieces over problems when their minds are scattered. A devotee came to me recently and said, I'm just torn asunder today. The reason for that kind of reaction or emotional response is the lack of a steadying philosophy to hold on to. Master used to tell us to make God the pole star of our lives so that throughout all experiences, the mind is revolving around him. If you take something daily from Master's writings and then in the midst of activities and work, keep coming back to that thought, pulling your mind away for even just an instant, it will enable you to maintain an inner balance and strength and it will help you to become more anchored in God. So if we conclude and wrap all of this up, I think, I think the, the takeaway, certainly for me, was that we have been given so much and we are so taken care of, not only in a, with what the Guru has given us, but in the, in the life that we've chosen as a yogi in today's modern world. We all have challenges. We all are trying to overcome them. We hope that in these times that are posing difficulties for many around the world, that you find your anchor, you find your support, you find your inspiration in our Guru and his teachings. And just know that you're not alone. He is with you. He looks after his devotees, as you all know. So our blessings, our prayers, our best wishes are with you as we go forward. Jai Guru. So let us now pray for others for a few moments and then we'll practice Master's healing technique. So let us now have our healing technique that Guruji gives for sending healing vibrations to others and to the entire world. Let us pray together. Divine Mother, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their bodies. Rub the hands together. Feel your building energy. Raise the arms and chant Om for healing of the body. Om. Divine Mother, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their minds. Rotate the hands. Chant Om for healing of the mind. Om. Divine Mother, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence 
in their souls. For healing of the soul. Oh. Let us raise the arms and chant Om once more for peace and harmony throughout the world. Om. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Akteshwar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda. Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Divine Mother, teach us to find thy presence on the altar of our constant peace and in the joy that springs from deep meditation. And may thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion. And may we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om. Peace. Amen. May God and Master bless us all. <laughs>